Glory be to God, we are on this platform again, the platform of, the, of church doctrine, uh, which has been coming to you every week. And today, we take another episode in our study. We have been studying the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost for all believers. Nine gifts of the Holy Ghost for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of the church. It is for all believers, young and old, men and women, not for ministers only. And what we are saying here, therefore, is important for all members. Let us take uh, particular attention. Let's pay a particular attention to these messages. They are useful. Please contact us on any questions that you may have. We'll be delighted to help you on. God intends that you should understand. And we are here to make you understand. Now, we started by saying that God reveals himself in the Bible as a trinity. A Godhead of three beings, three persons, all equal in all respects. No inferiority, no superiority. But for the purpose of the salvation of man, they have taken various roles that appears uh, as if one is superior to the other. No, it is in respect of our salvation that they have taken on, on the role of, of the various uh, parts they played to execute the salvation of man. You know, in the beginning, the Bible tells us uh, at the council in heaven, God said, who will go for us? Uh, who will go for us, meaning we are more than one. And one said, I will go. And that one who said he will go came and became the son because he came and entered into the womb of Mary to be born as the son of God. He is God, though. He is God. But God is his spirit. The Father is his spirit. The Son is his spirit. The Holy Spirit is his spirit. All the three of them, they are spirits. And so the one that became Jesus Christ came. His, that spirit entered into the womb of Mary and became uh, conceived, uh, was born as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The third person became the Holy Spirit, uh, like uh, the executor of the uh, program of salvation. The Son came, came primarily to be sacrificed. The purpose of the Son coming is primarily to be sacrificed as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He came to, because nobody, nobody was found worthy amongst men to be able to uh, shed his blood for the sins of man, because every man had been tainted with sin See, from the initial creation in the Garden of Eden. Uh, man became tainted with sin and polluted blood and therefore could not be offered as a sacrifice for, for, for man. And it required God himself to come in the form of man. That's why Jesus Christ came and became flesh. The Bible tells us that God came and became flesh and we saw him uh, in body and flesh. Uh, so, 
when he came, he came to sacrifice. That was his main purpose. Then, having sacrificed, he, got, he had gathered the people who follow his way and uh, walk the principles by which they could be acceptable to God, which they could have fellowship with God. And the Holy Spirit came to uh, make it possible for man to be able to access the benefits of uh, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. All the three persons, they are all equal in all respects. But for our salvation, God, the Father, the Head, the Son, the Redeemer, the Holy Spirit is the power, power to implement, to achieve the, the design of salvation in which man is redeemed and brought back to God. So we saw the Godhead as a Godhead of three persons. And we've dealt with this in the past, but I'm trying to see, let you see how we have come to where we are now. And we said the three persons are gift-giving persons. The Trinity is a gift-giving Trinity, meaning that the Father is a gift-giving Father. What did the Father give? He gave his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's John 3:16. So God is a God the Father is a is a God is a gift giving God. And then the Son. The Son is also a gift giving Son. He gave himself first. He gave himself to to, to come to this world to die. He said, I came and laid down my life. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. So he willingly surrendered himself. He gave himself to, the, uh, to be sacrificed, to be crucified on the cross of Calvary. He gave himself. So it's a gift-giving son. The Holy Spirit, even the son gave also the Holy Spirit. He, he and the father said, uh, they, they will give the Holy Spirit. They gave the Holy Spirit. The, the, Jesus Christ said, uh, the Father will send him in my name. Uh, he himself said, the person, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send. He is the one who sent the Holy Spirit. When he was, about, when he was on earth, he told his disciples he, he had to go away so that he might send the Holy Spirit so to continue the work of salvation in the heart of men. So the three of them give him. The Holy Spirit gave the gifts, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we are discussing. Uh, and we started by saying that the first thing is that the Holy Ghost was given to us, the person, this third person of the Trinity was given, given to us, given to man. God gave, the Father gave. So, so the first thing we learned that there is a, uh, the incoming of the Holy Spirit was the implementation of the promise of the Father to give the Holy Ghost. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came in a new dimension, a new way. Not that he had never been in the world, he had been. He, in the Old Testament, we see him uh, empowering some people. Uh, David was said to have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the uh, book of uh, the judges, we see many judges filled with the Holy Spirit. Othenia, he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and several people filled with the Holy Spirit. These are evidences of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the, new, the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, he came in a, a new way. As we read it in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, where is, is, we are told that he, where the disciples were in the upper room, uh, after the uh, ascension of Jesus Christ, and uh, it appeared that the, the disciples were afraid and they didn't know what, what would become of them now that Jesus Christ had come, had gone away. So we are told, as they gathered in the, in the upper room, uh, verse 4 of Acts chapter 2 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with uh, other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwellers, okay, there were many people in Jerusalem at that time who had gathered for one ceremony or the other. And early in the morning, they saw these people speaking in tongues, speaking various languages, and uh, they wondered what happened. So this was the coming of the Holy Ghost in a unique way. So the 12, I mean, all those who were present, the 120 people present in the upper room on that day, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Everyone, uh, the Holy Ghost sat upon each one. And Verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like of, as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Each of them. This time, not just for some specific people, for some specific tasks, but now it sat on everyone, everyone, every one of them is expected to receive the Holy Ghost. They, they did receive it. And uh, when we see the same thing happen in the house of uh, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, uh, they, were, they were all listening to Peter who had come to minister to Cornelius about the vision he said. So, as he was speaking, verse 44 of Acts 10 says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which had the word. The Holy Ghost fell on all them. This is, these are Gentiles. The first one, the Jews, on the day of Pentecost. And so, what well, we now have a new dispensation of the Holy Ghost given to all believers. All those who believe are given the Holy Spirit. Now, that is what we try to uh, show that this gift of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. Every believer. And uh, is now not just given for uh, some specific occasion, but now the Comforter is given to abide with us, to abide in us. So, that's the giving of the Holy Ghost. God, the Father, and the Son gave the Holy Spirit. And we saw the manifestation of the Holy Spirit coming as a gift to mankind. And then we went on to discuss the fact that 
the purpose of the Holy Ghost being given to us is to take hold of us and flow into us. The inflowing of you know, the Holy Spirit into us so that it can flow, the Holy Spirit can flow out again in the execution of power and ministry. Last week, we discussed the infilling of the Holy Ghost. The infilling of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that the, Holy, the, the pledge of Jesus Christ was to send the Holy Spirit who would not only abide with the disciples forever, but also be in them. You will be in them. So, and then, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, he became, he came like a cloven tongues, like of a fire, which sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That I've already read to us in Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. I also read to you the experience in the uh, house of Cornelius when they received the Holy Ghost and Peter said in Acts chapter 10 verse 47, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which, were, which have received the gift of the Holy Ghost as well as we. They received it just as the Jews received it on the day of Pentecost. So the experience of the infilling is distinct and follows the experience of regeneration. Even though the two are all the works of the Holy Spirit, but yet it is for believers. The infilling of the Holy Ghost comes after regeneration. It is for regenerated people, people who are born again, people who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we have this, this fact before us that the gift of the Holy Ghost is given to mankind generally, but it's also meant to fill the heart of each believer. And we said that the first experience of a believer being filled with the Holy Ghost is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism. That initial ex experience is called the baptism. But thereafter, there is continuous infilling. It is to be now a, a regular thing. You, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost when you are going to your farm. We, there is a story that uh, uh, later Pastor Joseph Babalola was driving his uh, caterpillar on, my, on a road construction work when the Holy Ghost came upon him and he started and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. So you can be filled with the Holy Ghost wherever you are. You, you are at home, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. You are in the farm, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. You are on the road, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. You are filled with the Holy Ghost anywhere you are. Uh, we said this last week that it is meant for everyone. The initial ex experience, we said, it's called the baptism. But thereafter, uh, there is uh, a continuous infilling which we are expected to experience. Now, the, we, we emphasize towards the end of last message, we emphasize the fact that the Holy Ghost is given to those who ask. You have to ask. There is a principle that Jesus Christ himself taught, ask and it shall be given unto you. So there is uh, 
a free will given to man which God does not destroy. You choose what you want. Ask and you shall be given. So we see the Holy Ghost in feeling. Initially as a baptism and continuously thereafter. When uh, uh, the epistle of, of Paul to Ephesians in chapter 5 verse 18, he said, be being filled. That is, be uh, continuously filled. Be being filled, be filled with the Holy Ghost. That, that uh, expression is really means be being filled, be, continue to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit. That means be being filled, continuous filling with the Holy Spirit. That is supposed to be the experience of the believer. Now, that's where we ended last week. Today, we are going to take on another uh, topic. What is the purpose of the infilling? It is for the outflowing of the Holy Spirit in our life to live the life of the child of God according to the principles of the kingdom of God and to be able to work and to perform uh, with the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. So today we are discussing the outflowing of the Holy Spirit and to close the, the topic this month, we, this second month of our teaching, we are going, we will discuss next week the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus Christ. This, that is an important topic which will uh, guide us more. But for now, we are talking today on the outflow of the Holy Spirit. Outflow. In feeling, in coming in feeling, and what purpose, not, not, not just for fun, but for outflowing in power and knowledge and wisdom and the characteristics of God. Now is we, we have God in us. The Holy Spirit in us is God in us. And God flowing through us in our work and in our living. That is what we are going to discuss today. And the first point, we are going to discuss about 10 points. The first point, the purpose of the infilling with the Holy Spirit is to empower the believer to live the life of Christ. It empowers us. Before Jesus come, he came with his uh, redeeming power. Sin had destroyed human nature. Human nature became uh, totally uh, worthless. The, uh, our tenet number two talks of the utter depravity of human nature. Human nature has been totally depraved. 
uh, unable to, to perform, unable to do well, unable to achieve his objective, unable to help himself, uh, human nature has become a captive of Satan. And the, there is a, ten, a natural tendency towards evil. Uh, it's like uh, uh, the, one of our late fathers used to describe that a, a crab can never walk straight. Can, a crab can, not, can never walk straight. Well, it walks sideways. It walks sideways. Uh, that's the nature. It walks sideways. Now, our nature has been bent by sin. It is only uh, at regeneration that God is recovering for us the lost nature. First of all, he takes out the old nature, puts the new nature, empowers it, the new nature, to be able to achieve what is intended. Jesus Christ said in Luke 24, 20, 49, and said that, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. We need that power from on high to be able to live according to the principles of the kingdom of God. We also read in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be my uh, witness, ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. If you remember the, that experience, it is uh, uh, worth telling again. The disciples had all met. Uh, they were with Jesus Christ. He was about to leave them after his uh, uh, resurrection. He had been with them for 40 days, and he was going to ascend to heaven. And the disciples, the, this is the funny thing, the disciples, when Jesus Christ was talking about his going away, the disciples then asked him a question, which is instructive for us today. What was the question? The, Jesus had told them that he was going to go away and that he would baptize the people with the Holy Ghost. Now, the disciples then asked, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? This is verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. This is well after Jesus Christ had told them that you are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So the promise of the Father is coming. You, you have had him. Uh, and John, he said, and John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And lo and behold, the question of the disciples to Jesus Christ, verse 6, and when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He, did Jesus Christ come to restore the, king, the kingdom to Israel? He told them his kingdom is not of this earth. But the disciples seem not to have understood. 
And so they said, well, well we expect that uh, you, you, are going to, you are going to give us uh, freedom. Uh, freedom from the Roman uh, uh, colonial power. We are going to become an independent nation. And Jesus Christ said, look, you, you don't seem to understand what, what you have in After He just told them, no, look, you are, you are going to be free. You are going to receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in all Samaria, on to the uttermost parts of the earth. So this is what Jesus Christ said to the disciples when they asked a question that was irrelevant to the issue at hand. Many of us are also likely to be diverted to issues of irrelevance. And the Holy Spirit must come to redirect us. Otherwise, the natural tendency towards uh, things of the flesh, material things, will continue to uh, override our desires and uh, plans. So, the Holy Ghost is, will come to give us power to do what we should do. That's the first point. Second point, no man can live the life of Christ on his own strength without the Holy Spirit. He needs the paraclete to make him stand. Let's read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, which says, Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a cost, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Another scripture, Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. In other words, we are not capable to do what we are expected to do. We have already said that the nature of man, human nature has been twisted and uh, polluted such that there is a tendency to was evil. But Jesus Christ has come to replace that demented nature with the nature of God. And that nature must be empowered with the Holy Spirit to be able to implement the, the intentions of God. So that's, that's the second one. The third point Concerning this life of Christ, Paul had this to say in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, the life that we are now living, we are living by the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we, we're going to look at this in the next two points. We're going to look at it carefully. The first point is that the exercise of the gifts of the Spirit 
is obviously dependent on being filled with the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit in order to be able to uh, exercise the good gifts, the good to implement good service to God, to work uh, effectively, uh, not not uh, in vain, but effectively. You know, Jesus Christ told the disciples during the, his, his trial, just before he was arrested, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We thought last year, we thought uh, the, the fact that man is a, is a, a trinity too of spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is the part that relates to God. The flesh is the part that relates to the world, the, the, the environment. And the spirit is in between, is the battleground, is in, is in between the spirit and the flesh. And there the, the, the spirit and the flesh uh, the, 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 the battle like we have in the uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and uh, I believe verse 17 it says the Galatians chapter 5 Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The spirit wants to do something the flesh is looking the opposite direction. The spirit is looking up what to God is from God. It really can, it, it can relate to the things of God. The, the, our spirit can relate to the things of God. But the flesh, the flesh is the house in which the spirit uh, resides. And the two of them are having different interests. The flesh is looking for the comfort of this world. The spirit is looking at the things of God. So the question now is which, which way do we move depending on the battle that is between the spirit and the flesh? And depending on which is stronger, if the spirit of God is stronger, if the spirit is stronger, the spirit of man, if it is stronger, then is able to uh, uh, overcome the desires of the flesh and can rule you to do what uh, the, the spirit wants. So the, the, that battle, as to what to do is uh, a fault in the soul. So now the, we are trying to say that the gifts of the spirit is exercised to please God, to do the things that are in line with the principles of God. 
Not only that, those, those are the gifts of the Spirit for walking in the church and doing the will of God in the church. Uh, but also, there is the living, our, our, our daily living. That, that is also uh, uh, the purpose of the Spirit, the purpose of the outflowing of the Spirit is to make us to, 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 to fruitfulness in the life of, uh, of us as believers, in our life as believers. Fruitfulness, it leads us to that life. What, what are the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit? Uh, Galatians 5, uh, Galatians 5, um, verse 20, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, faith, goodness meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and loss. So, the power of the Holy Spirit, the outflowing of the Holy Spirit in us, is to crucify the flesh, as I demonstrated. The, our spirit is, up, is looking upwards to God. It has his attraction for the things of God. He can understand the things of the spirit of God. He can appreciate but the flesh is the physical body in which the, the spirit lives. The spirit only lives within the physical body. But the physical body relates to this world. Uh, so the, 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 the flesh, the body is looking downwards or earthward towards the world and the things that please the flesh are the things of the world. Uh, pride, uh, things that, are, that man will, uh, will uh, nature, human nature will appreciate your fellow people will, will uh, praise you for, for your money, for your, your vehicle. If you have a good vehicle, you, people will praise you. I had a very un, unpleasant experience once when a, a man was driving a Mercedes car. He parked it in front of our secretariat and came to us in the Sunday school office and we were talking. And then somebody else came. This was some time ago when this uh, new flashy cars came, Lexus or, uh, and others like that, flashy looking. So he went down. And he, came, he saw this new flashy car parked by his own car. And he was riding a Mercedes. So. But as at that time, Mercedes had become uh, old. Uh, the new vehicles are now coming, Lexus and, and the others. So he went, and he, this man went downstairs from the... Uh, our Sunday school office in the secretariat, 
and met his car, which he had parked outside, met this new flashy car uh, parked by his home. Oh, he was so sad. He came back, came back to us. He said, he, he, he said, somebody, somebody killed me. And I said, you, how can you be talking? And you, see, you say, somebody killed you. He said, yes, somebody killed me. What did he do? He said, well, he packed a, a, a new flashy car by my old Mercedes. He, he killed me. I said, ah, are you interested? He said, no, I am going to, I'm, I'm, go, I'm going to, by next week, I'm going to acquire uh, something like that too. So, ah, are you so serious about it? He said, yes. And true, he went and bought two new uh, flashy cars like that that he, he would, uh, so he, one day he brought the vehicle to the office and said, yes, now I'm now alive. Uh, I, I, nobody can kill me any, anymore. I, I have the, the uh, I have what people enjoy, what people like. So, but what I'm saying now is that the Holy Spirit is to kill that tendency in man, desire to uh, run after the things of the material things of the world. The Holy Spirit will, will kill that. That's what it says in verse 20. Uh, four, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and loss. So the Holy Spirit is there outflowing to first of all conquer the, the human, the natural loss, the flesh within you to conquer it, to crucify it, so that the spirit will be enlarged and empowered to take on the things of God. So we see the, the Holy Spirit, the outflow of the Holy Spirit works in us and works through us. The Holy Spirit is a remembrance, a reminding us of all what Jesus has taught us. He enlightens the mind of the believer. The believer needs the Holy Spirit to guide him in his mind, in his ministry, as to where to go and what to do or how to do and when to do what. These are the reasons why the, you are, the Holy Spirit is coming into you. So that in his flowing out, you have these benefits. The believer must, be, must constantly experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit to sustain a constant outflow in the believer's ministry. And finally, the continuous infilling requires constant emptying one's life of self. For only an empty vessel has room for receiving more substance. We must constantly open ourselves for more of the Spirit. These are the reasons why we, are, we receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost to flow out to bring out the nature of God, the power to live. That's, that's the purpose of the infilling in our work, in our life, so that our lives will portray the glory of God. May the Lord help us as we understand 
these uh, important lessons. Thank you very much. And here we are going to stop. Next week, be with us and we shall let you see the ministry of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we have spoken concerning the work of the Holy Spirit, the outflow of the Holy Spirit in us. First of all, conquering our, ourselves to be used to be effective channels for God in executing his praise and his policy. That which we have said today, we pray that you make your people understand. Thank you very much for today. And next week, when we gather together, we have cause to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remember that you have, if you have any questions, contact us on the number on the screen. You will, it will reach us. We will answer and reach you and uh, let others learn from your questions too. Thank you very much.